This is my uh, least favorite part of the job, which is quelling and quashing uh, networking and useful dialogue between folks who don't always get to see each other. However, I'm supposed to keep us on time, so I'd like to get us started. I'm Ned Kalange. I'm President and CEO of the Colorado Trust. I want to welcome you to uh, today's Health Equity Learning Series event. Uh, we're thrilled that you, that you uh, um, braved the torrential uh, rains and the ponds and the floods. I, I doubt if there's anyone here from Boulder. If there is, I really think that you've done uh, a yeoman's job in getting down. Uh, of course, our uh, hopes and prayers go out to all those in the state who are suffering or being negatively impacted by what is something we've been asking for for the last three years, which is good water. Um, so I'm glad you're here. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, I need to do just a, a couple of things. Uh, I always like to uh, recognize uh, our elected officials who are with us today. So Representative McCann and Representative Joshi, thanks for coming and thanks for joining us. Um, at your place, you'll find some materials uh, that I just want to orient you to. Uh, the first is an executive summary of the National Stakeholder Strategy for Achieving Health Equity. This is a nationally <clears throat> developed roadmap for eliminating health disparities through collaboration and partnerships. You'll also have a new uh, report from us, a Colorado Trust report on the important role organizational leaders can play in guiding and supporting cultural competency development. I hope you take advantage of learning from that. Um, as with our reports, I have to tell you there are several contributors. I want to acknowledge two of those individuals today. Erica Baruch, who wrote the brief, and Sherry Walker, who edited it, are both with us today. Thanks for your hard work. These materials can also be found on our website if you're a digital person these days and are trying to eschew paper. Uh, but we also have some materials from the Connecticut Health Foundation, and you'll hear more about those in a few minutes. Then I also want to recognize our virtual participants. We're live streaming today uh, with the help of many communities across the state. And uh, if other people aren't facing the water or the rain challenges that we are, we're anticipating uh, more than 300 people uh, joining us through streaming across the state in areas including Alamosa, Cara Springs, Durango, Eagle, Fort Collins, Frisco, Grand Junction, Gunnison, Lamar, Leadville, Montrose, Monta Vista, Pueblo, Rifle, Steamboat, Yuma, and our newly added group, Telluride. So welcome to uh, the viewing party. Finally, we're also using social media today. If you'd like to follow the conversation um, on Twitter, please use the hashtag HealthEquityTCT. Uh, I think that stands for The Colorado Trust. So trying to get away from acronyms, and I think I got that one down. You can also submit uh, uh, questions via Twitter. We will do our best to answer all the questions we can today, whether you're in the room or streaming. Take your questions and continue the conversation following what I think will be very engaging presentations. To get us started, I'm pleased to introduce colleagues and leaders from three foundations across the country that focus on improving health equity in their communities. We'll start with Elizabeth Krauss, who's the Vice President of Policy and Communications at the Connecticut Health Foundation, who I've actually had the privilege of working with uh, when we were both at the State Health Department. Then Nicole Maher is president and CEO of the Northwest Foundation, Health Foundation in Oregon and Southwest Washington. And then finally, uh, Dr. Unique Redwood, who's the president and CEO of the Consumer Health Foundation in Washington, DC. We'll follow this with a discussion with all three leaders and take questions at that point. So now I'd like you to help uh, me welcome Elizabeth Krauss from the Connecticut Health Foundation. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to call myself a recovering program officer because while it's true that I'm VP of Policy and Communications, I uh, was a program officer managing the Connecticut Health Foundation's racial and ethnic health disparities portfolio of work for seven years. And because of that, uh, my Twitter handle is um, Proof Elizabeth. So that's P-R-O-O-F, uh, Elizabeth with a Z. So Proof Elizabeth. Uh, 
uh, that is at the end, but I thought I'd plug it now for those of you who are so inclined to uh, live tweet. So um, first I want to start off by uh, extending my uh, gratitude to the Colorado Trust for putting on this health equity learning series and inviting me to be part of it. Um, I, I hear this said frequently um, during Academy Award ceremonies and speeches everywhere, but you know, when I look at the lineup of speakers, the Adewale Troutmans, the Brian Smedleys, I'm like, what is Elizabeth Krauss uh, doing on that lineup? So it's, it's really um, humbling and an honor to uh, be part of this learning series. And the Connecticut Health Foundation um, is on a, a parallel track. Uh, we uh, just this year announced a strategic shift to make health equity uh, my foundation's uh, central focus. And so we are going around Connecticut to um, help the residents of my state to better understand uh, what health equity is and what the viable solutions are. And so I was uh, pleased to be part of the conversation here in Colorado. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, as Ned mentioned, I um, owe Colorado a lot on my health equity journey. Um, I came here about 10 years ago and spent two years uh, working at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Uh, Judy McCree Carrington, who's in the audience, is uh, pictured up there. And um, I started with uh, what at the time was the Turning Point Initiative. It was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded uh, grant initiative focused on public health systems change, and Colorado decided to focus its efforts on um, racial and ethnic health disparities. And so in my two years there, we took the uh, Turning Point Initiative from a temporary grant-funded program to a permanent uh, state entity. Now, I tried to look for a photo with Ned. I think he was there at the the bottom picture, we're actually accepting a check from Kaiser Permanente of Colorado. <laughs> um, and Ned was at that lunch, but he must have ducked out of the photo. Um, I'm also one of the authors of the 2005 uh, Health Disparity Surveillance Report. So, um, well, I can't fully claim to be um, homegrown. Again, I owe Colorado a lot for what has become a, a career devotion to the issue of health equity. Um, I thought I'd start by uh, orienting you to where I am now, though, and that is the state of Connecticut. Um, so I, I've noticed that people who um, aren't from New England don't tend to spend a lot of time considering this little bitty state uh, in southern New England. Um, and even our neighbors, New York, tend to, as you can see there, uh, think of us as uh, tennis courts. So they also think of Colorado as uh, their ski slopes. So, uh, but in all seriousness, we are um, a tiny but mighty state. Uh, we are only 70 miles by 110 miles, which probably seems like a dream to people in large mountainous states with many rural regions. Um, I'm in centrally located, so that means that I can get to most places places within the state within an hour and some of the remote or more high traffic areas within two hours. But it um, is convenient uh, for getting around and uh, meeting with people. Um, we have a total of 3.5 million residents and um, we have a reputation uh, for being the wealthiest state in one of the wealthiest nations in the world. And it's true that there is a quite a lot of affluence in uh, Connecticut, but this is an important backdrop to what is often referred to as, as two Connecticut's. Um, Connecticut is home to um, some of our country's poorest urban areas, um, New Haven, Hartford, Bridgeport. Uh, these cities uh, have high populations of uh, people of color and a lot of the socioeconomic and uh, health inequities that go along with it. So. Um, we are, are not just um, a, a place where we have um, you know, Yale Medical School and we're home to Aetna, but we also have um, some significant challenges. Um, I am with the Connecticut Health Foundation. We are a health legacy foundation. Uh, our assets are in the approximately $100 million range. So uh, we are not a, a billion dollar foundation. So this means that we have to leverage our resources uh, wisely. And like many foundations, the um, change that we envision uh, requires more than the resources that we can invest. So we need to uh, work with um, partners uh, across sectors to um, see that change. Um, we just, uh, as I mentioned in April, announced a strategic shift. So uh, we spent um, 
since our beginnings in 1999 as a foundation that uh, was more of a, a categorical funder. We um, funded um, the issue of racial and ethnic health disparities, um, oral health for low-income families, and children's mental health. And uh, we have um, a, a new strategic plan that will uh, take us out of um, children's mental health and oral health, and we will make health equity our uh, central focus moving forward. But I wanted to contextualize uh, where we're coming from. And, and I will back up and say, to the Connecticut Health Foundation, health equity means helping more people gain access to better care. More access, better care. And we're particularly focused on uh, people of color. And that is the natural evolution of our 13 years of history um, working in racial and ethnic health disparities. So health equity, and I know you've spent a lot of time through this learning series looking at different definitions. You know there's no universal definition. And that health equity encompasses a lot of groups that experience inequities. But again, to kind of go along um, the, the path that we've forged, it's helping more people of color gain access to better care. But over our history, um, as you'll see in this timeline there, we've um, funded a lot of different health equity initiatives. So everything from cultural competence, workforce diversity, community-based health promotion, um, policy, health literacy, um, diabetes and safety net centers. Uh, we have a social media initiative. So we've, we've sort of seen the spectrum of what's out there. And our takeaway is that health equity is a big tent issue. And I think that's a, a, a beautiful strength of the issue because it's, it's really inclusive. And um, there are different ways that our community members experience inequities and there's room for us all to come together to try to make um, healthcare and public health more equitable. But this is also a tremendous challenge for health equity stakeholders. And, and I'm sure I don't have to tell those of you in the room what happens when you get all the stakeholders under this one tent and you try to find a common ground to work on together. Um, it, it's hard and you spend a lot of time forming, storming, norming, and reforming and not enough time in action orientation. And it's even sort of hard to figure out um, when to divide and conquer and when it makes sense to come together uh, to work in lockstep to um, meet a, a, a time-sensitive objective. So the Connecticut Health Foundation felt that we owed it to ourselves and to our partners to be crystal clear about the piece of the health equity puzzle that we were going to hold ourselves accountable to. And again, that's helping more people of color gain access to better care, understanding that health equity is uh, much bigger than that. Um, a, a criticism I frequently hear of foundations, and I think it's earned, is that there's lack of clarity. And uh, without throwing my colleagues under the bus, I won't name names, but I recently, within the last couple of months, got an email from another uh, healthcare conversion foundation, um, and they announced a new strategic plan. And I, I know people who work there. I'm pretty familiar with them. I went to the web page. It was pretty. I read what was there, and I left not quite sure what they were looking to fund. Um, and, and so we didn't want people to have that experience. So again, we wanted to break it down, not that these are easy things to address, but in understandable ways. So in trying to help more people of color gain access to better care in Connecticut, uh, the Connecticut Health Foundation has a, a three-step approach. And you all have a copy of this visualization at your tables. But we want to take this historic moment to leverage health reform. Um, we think that it is a, a tremendous historical opportunity to measure, measurably advance um, health equity. So the Connecticut Health Foundation is very focused on uh, helping people to get enrolled in affordable health care. And I want to add that we want them to stay enrolled, too. It's, it's continuous coverage. Um, once in the system, we want to help them to navigate the system. Uh, we want them to be able to receive the care that they need at the right time in the right place and we want to ensure that community-based care settings are uh, full participants in the system so that includes school-based health centers federally qualified health centers and other community providers and then we think it's the system's responsibility to ensure that people actually receive better care and we define better care as care that's affordable comprehensive, so that brings together physical, mental, and oral health, and that care that's ultimately accountable for improving our, our lives and our, our health. 
So that's what we are endeavoring to do. And we do have some um, emerging uh, literature to suggest that um, if we uh, get people covered and we get them into medical homes, that's coordinated um, usual sources of care, that we actually see disparities begin to uh, reduce. So I think this is particularly exciting because um, as you know here, health inequities are, are pretty intractable. It's hard to get that needle to move. So while focusing on healthcare access and delivery um, isn't going to magically uh, solve the problem of health equity, uh, we, our, our hypothesis is that if we do this, we are going to see the needle begin to move. Uh, the Connecticut Health Foundation um, is trying to position itself as a, a incubator of health equity solutions. We've spent a lot of time um, describing and measuring the issue and, and sort of field building, but now we want to look at how we can fund grants, leverage public policy, develop leaders, and use strategic communications to actually begin to change things. Um, and the trust asked me to highlight a couple of the solutions that we are focused on. So I was just going to go through a few. Um, one, I mentioned that um, we're, we're pretty um, obsessed with all things ACA right now. And we know that having um, community-based navigators and assisters is going to be uh, critical, especially in communities of color and communities where there are a lot of people who um, don't speak uh, English at home to uh, help get them enrolled. So the Connecticut Health Foundation was um, the first foundation in the state to make a grant contribution to uh, our navigator program. Uh, we have a state facilitated uh, marketplace, much like you do here in Connecticut. So you probably know that there were federal funds for assisters, but not for navigators. Yet navigators were required by the ACA. So it was sort of an unfunded mandate. So we helped to uh, put up some funds for that and to convene our philanthropic partners to uh, kick in some additional resources. Uh, we also uh, provided in-kind funding for a, using, a choosing and using your dental benefits training module for the navigators and assisters uh, because dental insurance is a very different animal than health insurance. And we found that, um, we think that as uh, the navigators and assisters go out to communities, they're going to need uh, resources and tools to be able to explain dental insurance to people. And then we're involved in a lot of the inside the beltway uh, influence around uh, a lot of health policy issues. So I sit on a number of advisory committees. And then what we're looking to next is um, community health workers. And I want to pause to say that um, when I first came to the Connecticut Health Foundation, I'd funded some community health worker grants or the Connecticut Health Foundation did. And uh, what we found time and time again was when the grant ended, the poor community health worker ended up unemployed. And I had to take a step back and to examine whether I was being part of a problem rather than part of a solution. So I actually um, sort of called a moratorium on funding community health workers and it didn't make me feel good when people would call and ask for that type of funding and I'd say no and I, I'm sure that they were thinking oh she just doesn't get it but I want to assure you that when you're talking to funders we are listening even if we can't help you in the then and now and so we think that the ACA provides opportunities to um, systematize uh, community health workers and to find um, some funding mechanisms that will make them more sustainable so as we begin to shift out of navigators and assisters that's where we'll be looking next. Um, another thing that we do is that we try to equip advocates with strong policy analysis. So we um, go to think tanks, we go to universities, and we try to equip advocates with um, rigorous nonpartisan research that they can take to decision makers. Um, and um, I have the, right there you see our um, no wrong door infographic. So you have the policy brief at your table. Uh, and the infographic is hot off the press and I can distribute um, some copies if you're interested in the Cliff Notes version of the six page policy brief. But we always ensure that there is a constituency of advocates that want the research that we're about to put out uh, before we do it. And uh, that ensures that it's um, action-oriented research. Um, we also are starting up a health equity advocacy organization this year. Uh, we convene our advocacy grantees, our consultants, our partners annually to brainstorm our policy agenda. And a couple years back, somebody posed the question, whose job is it in Connecticut to advocate for health equity? 
And we looked around and we sort of said, well, nobody really, or we kind of do, but we're a foundation. We, we can't lobby their limitations and what we can do. And different organizations touch parts of the elephant, uh, but there's not centralized leadership for health equity advocacy. So this is um, some infrastructure that we are uh, seeding uh, this year, and it's going to be an independent uh, organization. It will not be the foundation. Um, and then we have a health, uh, a health Leadership Fellows program. Um, this is a 10-month program that takes 20 um, sort of middle-level health leaders each year and um, helps them to understand health equity issues and uh, to hone their leadership skills so that they can be the ambassadors for health equity um, in their home communities all throughout the state, in different sectors, in different workplaces. Um, they're 75% uh, people of color, and uh, these are the boots on the ground. They're our, our network, and they are um, invaluable in ensuring that health equity is a priority in Connecticut. And I'll just close by um, highlighting that we also think that media coverage is particularly important for keeping health equity a priority. So we are about to embark on a program for journalists. And so we've um, engaged Larry Tai, who is a New York Times bestselling author, but he also runs the Blue, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation in Massachusetts's uh, health coverage fellowship for journalists. This is a nine day intensive fellowship for journalists. We tend to sponsor one journalist annually to go through the program and we find that it um, greatly increases the quality and quantity of health reporting in Connecticut. Um, but he is going to do a mini version focused on health equity for us and in about a week and a half. And we're gonna bring together uh, journalists from all types of media and it will focus on not only understanding what health equity is, but giving them practical tips for better covering the issue and fi for finding the health equity angle that is inherent in almost every health equity and public health story. And our keynote is going to be uh, Suzanne Bohan, who's from the Bay Area. She wrote an award-winning four-part series um, on shortened lives, uh, where, you're, where You Live Matters. She's also working on a book about mortality disparities. And then former Surgeon General Jocelyn Elders will be one of our speakers. And I was going to say a word about evaluation, but I've gone over time. So if you really want to know, you can ask about that later. But thanks again to the Colorado Trust. Thanks, Elizabeth. I'll remind you that we'll have time for questions for each of the speakers later. So I hope you take advantage of jotting down what you might like to ask. And now I'd like to welcome Nicole Maher, President and CEO from the Northwest Health Foundation. Welcome, Nicole. Klahaya, Katamaika, Kanoe, Nikatelikum, Gunesh Chish. I'm a member of the Clinkett tribe, and our custom is to always greet and appreciate and acknowledge that we're in someone else's land when we're there, so I'm a visitor. And I also wanted to acknowledge all of you as uh, new friends and relatives, which is also a custom of ours. And one thing that's very important to me as a Native American woman and leader of a foundation is to bring my culture with me everywhere that I go and to, and to share it because uh, the world of philanthropy and the face of this country is changing and it's one of the, the greatest opportunities we have and I like to share it. So today I'm really honored to be here and talk to you a little bit about uh, the journey of Northwest Health Foundation and tell you a little bit about our community. And today I'm going to talk a lot about kind of the Portland region, which includes uh, Clark County in Washington, Multnomah, Clackamas, and Washington County, which uh, makes up about half of our population. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our story and our experience and how we're changing. Uh, but I want to assure you that this story is actually really relevant to our entire state and our region. We're a unique um, area in that we do have what is oftentimes referred to as a urban-rural divide, and oftentimes there's an assumption made that our diversity is located in our urban centers, but that's actually not true. Um, our urban uh, counties, for example, Multnomah County is actually the seventh most diverse uh, county. Many of our rural communities are incredibly diverse, and so as I share that story, um, it will be a little bit centric in the urban area, but it, there is deep relevance in our, our rural communities as well. So a lot of people have thoughts about Portland, Oregon. We have a wonderful show called Portlandia. Uh, 
don't ever try to count the number of people of color in it because you will uh, only need about two to three fingers on you. Uh, but that's not actually the truth. Uh, our community is quite diverse. Uh, one out of every three adults is a person of color, and six out of every ten children uh, are people of color in our community. And we are uh, growing quickly. Uh, half of our people of color are under the age of 18, and about 70% are under the age of 35. And so when you think about birth rates and where our community is going, our young people, we are already uh, a place of majority minority, and we will soon get there with our adults. Uh, but we as a community have created a myth about ourselves so that we don't have to have difficult conversations. So when you're in conversations, you will often hear people talk about us being a very white state or a very white city. Um, and so the idea is that if you say that, you then don't have to address all the things that are happening. And we at Northwest Health Foundation have been working to bring leaders to come together to, to address that. Because we believe that when you look at the health outcomes of our community and where there is the greatest opportunity to make an impact impact that actually resides within our communities of color and our underserved communities. If you actually want to move the dial, regardless of your motivation, if you believe it's a moral obligation, if you just want to be successful, that's where you're going to make the greatest change. And we have been on this journey as a philanthropic organization. And I'm kind of interesting because I was a trustee for five years, and then I joined as the president a little bit over a year ago. Um, and then I did a lot of work partnering with the foundation through my previous role. So I, I bring many hats and perspectives to this conversation. But about five years ago, we began to look at where we were making grants. And while um, our staff was very astute at looking at the data and reflecting on where the opportunity existed, we continued to see a lack of applications in our traditional grant making from communities of color. And we did um, all the same things that many foundations do. We said, well, they're not turning in applications, or maybe there's not capacity. and um, you know, and, and really great people, um, very smart, very well intentioned, um, and we were just not getting the applications. And you know, we've all been part of this, these conversations either in our roles as nonprofit leaders or in philanthropic rooms where it's much easier to think that it's a problem out in the community than perhaps a problem within our philanthropic organization. And our board at that time um, did a very courageous thing and really worked with the staff and we had a lot of excitement on our staff um, side as well to really think about how to have very, very different relationships. And that was new to us. Our historic presence as a foundation was really, uh, it began as very much a responsive grant maker. We then moved upstream and started doing more system reform. Um, but we had been um, really comfortable partnering with folks who looked a lot like us and behaved a lot like us. And so what we did was actually forge a deep partnership with a pretty phenomenal organization um, who deserves a lot of credit for the progress that we have made as a foundation called the Coalition of Communities of Color. And what we asked them to do was to join join us in this effort to help us have a deeper presence in communities, to help us go and be a listener and to learn from them. And we asked them to give us really honest, harsh feedback about how philanthropy was impacting them or not impacting them. And they're an interesting organization, and I feel like um, we need to give them a lot of credit, and I, I think it's important to tell you about their structure as well, uh, because they're a consensus-based group made up of six ethnic communities, um, and their leadership is actually elected by the communities that they represent. So it's very different than what you've seen in sort of historic gatekeeper models, where someone might say, oh, I represent community X, or I'm the person with the relationship with the, the philanthropic organization, therefore I get to explain the narrative of how community X is experiencing health. Um, is very much an organization that is led by the community for the community. And um, all of the organizations represented within the coalition are also organizations who've experienced a series of disappointments with philanthropy. And so they were willing to take a risk with us. We were vulnerable and said, we need help. We need different relationships and we need a different understanding. And we're asking you to take a risk to sort of get your hopes up that philanthropy can rise to the occasion and change. And they did. And so I won't go into all of the details except to say that we spent almost two years in deep conversation with them. It fundamentally shifted the way that we do our work. And it also has had some interesting results on the rest of philanthropy. 
One of the results that came out of this work is actually our foundation and several other foundations uh, commissioned a report really looking at the trends in funding in Oregon for communities of color. And the results, no surprise, were, were pretty disappointing. Um, you know, com communities such as the Latino community who make up more than 20% of our state were getting about 3% of the philanthropic dollars. And oftentimes when you looked at where the dollars that were going to serve the Latino community, they weren't actually going to Latino-led organizations. They were going to white organizations to do a better job with Latinos and not always getting the best results. Um, that's one example, but the results for every other community of color were were pretty dire. Um, Native Americans, for example, um, were 3% of the population. They received 0.07% of the funds, but most of the money actually went to universities and museums to either do exhibits or research on us, not for us. So you could see where um, it was pretty jarring, and it was hard for the philanthropic community to learn that about ourselves. Um, we are often known as a very liberal and progressive state. Um, we love to show our awards for sustainability, green living, and public transportation. And when we saw that report, as well as a series of other data reports that the coalition did, um, it was jarring to find out that we have some of the worst disparities in the country for people of color. And it was jarring to find um, out that our outcomes for people of color and our outcomes for white folks were totally different. And I'll sum it up in a, a simple sentence. What we found that is that in Oregon, if you're white and you live in Oregon, you're doing significantly better than your white counterparts in every other major city. If you are black, Latino, Native American, Asian, or from a respective immigrant community, and you compare your outcomes to other major metropolitan areas, you're actually doing worse. And what that means is if you average all of those numbers together, our whole state is doing worse. But it's, it's a different experience for different people. And that was very, very difficult for us. And so the way that we have been addressing it at the foundation is first through the report, looking at the data, a series of difficult conversations, bringing our other philanthropic partners along, and then really taking a hard look at the way that we do business. And we've made some, some good progress. I'm very proud to say that today we have a board that is majority minority. We have a staff that is majority minority, and over 50% of our philanthropic investments go to organizations uh, led by f and created on behalf of communities of color. And it has significantly impacted our outcomes in a very positive way. And I don't mean to, and we're very proud of those outcomes, but we still have a long way to go. Um, I mentioned in a meeting earlier today that as we continue to um, pull back the sheets and look at ourselves, we continue to, to discover other ways that we need to improve. Um, for example, when we looked at our contracting for consultants and businesses, uh, we have a long way to go to improve in that area. Uh, we had a little long way to go. We noticed um, when we averaged out our grant making that our discretionary grants did not reflect the same equity values as our competitive grant making. And so as we've moved along this continuum, We've really found that having honest, difficult conversations and recognizing that you're never actually going to arrive at, at the, the point of equity at any point in time, that it's a constant journey, has been really, really valuable for us. Uh, we have done some interesting institutional things. Our board has an equity committee. Um, our expectation is that our equity lens, um, we call it the case for equity, is um, used in every single decision and every single allocation of resource that we use. And so every other committee is expected to use that equity lens. Um, we've had some success sharing our equity lens with others. Uh, our equity lens, um, we are very pleased uh, when our several of our local school districts, our city, and more recently our state has adopted much of our equity language to hold our entire community accountable for this idea that we actually have a shared destiny and that if we all don't have a stake in equity and a stake in each other's future that we will collectively have worse outcomes together. Um, so that's been really exciting and really fun um, but we've also had some other great learnings along the way. Um, 
the report that I mentioned that talked about philanthropy, one of the things that was really phenomenal about it was that uh, leaders from communities of color and the coalition came together with philanthropic leaders and made a set of recommendations. Uh, and much of what I described about the things that we've changed in our work and the improvements that we've made came directly from that report. But there were also some really awkward things that came about. One thing that um, was noticed was that as the word equity started to come up more and this conversation became more prevalent, uh, communities began to lose um, lose a stake in defining the solution. So as it became clear that philanthropy with P was becoming interested in equity, suddenly every organization became an expert in equity and every organization suddenly wanted to work on those issues and to bring forward a solution on behalf of communities of color. And so that's one thing where we were sort of we didn't anticipate it, but we have to have a conversation about it. Um, it's a little ironic when organizations who have never served population X suddenly want to serve population X, and you have to ask yourself the question of, of course we want everyone to get better, and of course we need everyone to get better, but who um, actually has the solutions? And I think that's been a really important place that we have come to in our journey as an organization is this idea that the community experiencing the disparity has to be the community that creates creates the solutions and implements the solutions. And um, we continue to have to ask ourselves hard questions. How many of you have been in meetings where the room looks very different than the people experiencing the health disparities or experiencing the poverty? And we had to come to a place where we needed to stop just calling out that the right people weren't in the room, that we actually needed to stop having the conversation until the right people got in the room. And we needed to stop blaming the people who weren't in the room for not being there. We actually needed to to hold ourselves accountable for creating a circumstance that may not make them feel welcome in the room. And so those are a few pieces that have been um, really transformational for us. And as we move forward in our strategic plan, and we're moving to a place where we are making investments um, very far upstream and investing in what I mentioned before, um, some of the most marginalized communities with a focus on youth and the communities that they live in. Uh, but certainly, the, the, one of the greatest gifts that we have had is really that honest dialogue and the ability for communities to share that harsh feedback with us. We would not be where we are today without that and without that deep, honest relationship. And if I could leave you with any thoughts, some of these thoughts you know, are sort of cliche, but they're incredibly true, um, is that really, um, this work is hard and it's uncomfortable and you will absolutely make mistakes, but it is so much more important to make efforts and try and make mistakes along the way than to sort of go to that place where you just feel uncomfortable and immobilized. And the other piece that I would say is that I think as a country, we now understand the data in a different way. We now understand that we have this shared future and this shared destiny. And the time of trying hard or checking a box or putting an effort forward and not getting outcomes, I think that we have to say as leaders of nonprofits and philanthropic organizations that that can no longer be acceptable. We need different outcomes and we um, are dependent on the success of, of communities of color and low-income communities to be successful for our whole country to be successful. Thanks. Thanks, Nicole. Finally, I'd like to ask you all to help me welcoming uh, Dr. Unique Redwood, who's president and CEO of the Consumer Health Foundation in Washington, D.C. I, too, would like to thank the Colorado Trust for inviting me to be a part of the uh, health, health Equity Series. I, I consider it truly an honor, and I can't think of a conversation, a more important conversation to be having today. As part of the talk, the trust asked us to say a little about ourselves. And this reminded me of a conversation I had with Dr. Barbara Israel, chair of my dissertation committee, when I was a graduate student at University of Michigan School of Public Health. When I wrote my very first chapters and handed them into her, she said to me, you have not yet told the reader how you see the world. And so in the same vein, before I talk about the Consumer Health Foundation's solutions to advance health equity, I want to first share with you how I see the world. I come to this work acknowledging that I am governed by fear. I'm afraid that there isn't enough for all of us. 
And I know that this fear propels me, for example, to enroll my daughter all summer in prep classes to help her improve her ACT and SAT scores as she prepares for college next year. I know deep down I'm afraid. I'm afraid that she'll be left behind in a society where there is increased competition for seemingly scarce resources. Yet these days I'm starting to wonder, are these resources really that scarce after all? And I'm starting to believe that there really is enough for all of us, and I'm starting to um, feel like I don't have to be afraid. I acknowledge that I'm accountable for perpetuating systems that are broken, systems that limit the life choices of others. And I wake up every morning choosing to believe that I, we, can create better systems of organizing ourselves and distributing resources. I've been taught to believe that my success is due to hard work, determination, and innate ambition. Yet I choose to believe that my station in life is largely due to a bit of luck and a lot of opportunity. There's an African-American woman with whom I used to work in Atlanta when I was doing community-based research there. She's the same age as me, but her income is so negligible that even its comparison to the poverty line is heartrending. I choose to believe that we both work very hard to create a better life for ourselves and our children, and that she could be me and I could be her if any number of switches in opportunity had been made in history. And finally, I believe that we share a common humanity, which I best heard described by M. Lynn Huntley, then president of the Southern Education Foundation in the book Wit and Wisdom. She said, and I quote, we all basically want the same things. We want decent food, the capacity to care for ourselves and those whom we love, a safe place to live, some reasonable productive work, and the chance to enjoy some of the beautiful things in this world. So I joined the Consumer Health Foundation last year because I believed that I could practice my values and beliefs in the workplace. My emerging belief that there really is enough, that we can create better systems, that opportunity is the starting place for the reward of individual effort, and that we share a common humanity. So let me transition and tell you a little about the Consumer Health Foundation. We envision a region and a nation in which everyone has an equal opportunity to live a healthy and dignified life. By everyone, we mean all people, regardless of race, ethnicity, immigration status, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability, age, or income. This is our statement of health equity. We're a small private foundation located in Washington, D.C., and we fund work in the district as well as Northern Virginia and some parts of Maryland. We focus on both access to health care and the social determinants of health. So now a little context about the DC metropolitan area. This is a map of our region's subway line. If we take the red line, for example, those living in the eastern part of DC can expect to live a full nine years less on average than those living 17 metro stops away in Maryland to the Northwest. Much of this is due to the devastating effects of poverty and segregation. Now here's another map. This one shows you that workers who belong to the creative class of highly educated workers in purple are clustered on the west side of the district. And those who belong to the service class of domestic workers, restaurant workers, and other low-wage workers in red live on the east side. Notice that there is a blue bar in the legend to represent the working class. Also note that there is no working class to speak of on the map. So the District of Columbia, the seat of our nation, is a segregated town with almost no working class. It is segregated by class, and by race as seven of the top 10 census tracts with the greatest share of service class workers are in historically African American neighborhoods. And in addition, the district and the entire region for that matter are home to other people of color, such as Spanish speaking immigrants who too face daily barriers to accessing good food, safe housing, quality schools, and meaningful employment. 
So while the foundation focuses on access to health care in one part of its portfolio, we, uh, through funding for safety net clinics, primary care associations, and health reform implementation, we also know that people spend most of their lives in non-healthcare settings. And these settings where they live, learn, work, and play, if they're positive, support their ability to be healthy. If not, they contribute to disease, disability, and death. So for us, health equity has meant three strategic shifts. Funding efforts beyond health care, dedicating significant resources to advocacy for systems change, and investing in racial equity. These shifts came about following a series of community conversations where residents of the region told us what they believe is important to being able to live a healthy life. The first strategic shift was to begin funding organizations working on issues beyond health care, such as education, living wages, and safe and affordable housing. We also built partnerships with other funders who would not consider themselves health funders, but we wanted to support their efforts in areas such as workforce development and food equity. Again, we made these shifts because the public health literature tells us and the people told us that these are all important parts of a healthy life. Now our challenge is to balance the size of our staff and resources with the many aspects of health that are important. We're now asking ourselves if there are areas of focus that we're most suited to take on. The second strategic shift was to dedicate uh, significant resources to advocacy as a strategy to affect systems change. This includes research, community education, public will campaigns, policy analysis, community mobilization, and coalition, all aimed at supporting the implementation of healthful public policy. I visited a grantee last week, pictured here, that provides employment-related legal services for people whose employers, for example, just refuse to pay them for hours worked or cut their pay to a dollar per hour and threaten to report their lack of documentation to authorities if they refuse to accept this level of pay. The organization then looks for trends in these cases and uses the information to organize workers to advocate for better protections, living wages, and benefits like paid sick days. While grantees have uh, made uh, many strides, um, primarily as individual organizations, we're now considering how we might do a better job of understanding the collective field of advocacy around a particular issue. I don't have much time to walk through this chart, but it generally represents the various actors within a field. So for example, in the top left quadrant, community mobilization, to help determine what capacities might need to be strengthened so that the entire field can be successful. We're also spending some time this fall uh, trying to un uh, improve our evaluation framework. The field of advocacy evaluation is still emerging, so we're doing our best to figure out the most appropriate ways to evaluate what is or is not making a difference. The final strategic shift, which we are still working to fully realize, was to invest in racial equity. Within the context of health, we define racial equity as a goal and a process whereby people of color have an equal opportunity to live a healthy and dignified life. This is particularly important in our region because people of color are more likely to live in circumstances that limit their ability to be healthy, where there is little opportunity despite their individual effort. The initial stages of this work has included racial equity training for grantee partners and capacity building support to nonprofit organizations that want to focus more deeply and intently on racial equity within their organizations. We've also been collecting demographic data for the boards, management staff, and staff of our grantee partners to help us learn about their diversity practices. And finally, we acknowledge that talking about race and racism is difficult, and nonprofits often don't have the language to be able to help them discuss these issues publicly. So we support communications and media training on effective ways to frame and discuss racial equity to a wide array of audiences. As our nonprofit partners build more muscle in this area, we can then begin to move more intentionally into new areas of work, such as cross-racial coalition building and addressing implicit bias. I want to spend the last few minutes talking about one part of our work that is especially important to us, 
It's called the Wealth Building Initiative, a seed that we're planting to create a more fair economy, one that is based on the belief that there really is enough for all of us. And as we all know, when people are able to have income, build wealth, and make a meaningful contribution, they will be healthy, their families will be healthy, and communities will be healthy. Last year, we joined with other funders to bring the Evergreen Cooperative model based in Cleveland to the Washington, D.C. region. The model creates worker-owner cooperative businesses in low-income communities that serve large anchor institutions, such as hospitals, universities, and local governments. Cleveland now has three such businesses, a full-service laundry, a solar panel installation company, and a 3.25 acre greenhouse that grows just lettuce that is sold to food service organizations that serve those anchor institutions. In the uh, DC region, we're now in the implementation stage of a similar project and will launch one business by next year and create the infrastructure for several more businesses that will hire traditionally low wage workers who now have an ownership stake in their company and a living wage. Our international friends in Mondragon, Spain, have over 83,000 workers in over 250 such businesses. And right here in America, we're no stranger uh, to these worker-owner cooperatives, but we haven't yet built the will uh, to scale existing efforts. So let me return to the maps that I showed you earlier. What if we were able to really invest in building new forms of commerce that employed thousands of workers living on the east side of DC, for example, and they were able to earn a living wage? What if our beyond healthcare work was able to simultaneously create an equitable food system and a pathway from cradle to career for our young people? What if we were able to maximize our advocacy efforts such that there were better protections for workers and paid sick days? And what if we were intentional about targeting our strategies so that low-income communities with the greatest concentration of people of color, at least in our region, could become places of opportunity? Might this map look different for the next generation? Might this nine-year gap in life expectancy disappear? What about this map? Might there be more blue representing working class people? And might the colors be mixed up a bit as affordable housing options are created all throughout the city? In closing, the Consumer Health Foundation believes that health equity is about equal opportunity for all people to live a healthy and dignified life. And for us, that means going beyond health care dedicating resources to advocacy as a strategy for systems change, and investing in racial equity. It also means seeding innovations to entrenched problems like income inequality by investing in projects like the Wealth Building Initiative. I think it also means knowing our values. Ask yourself, do I believe that there is enough? Do I believe we can create better systems? Do I believe opportunity is the starting place for the reward of individual effort? Do I believe we share a common humanity? I think the answers to these kinds of questions will surely determine the work that we end up doing in the Washington, D.C. region, here in the state of Colorado, and around the country. I look forward to the discussion. Remarkable. I, I, I look at um, three smart, dynamic, articulate, passionate leaders. And um, I, I call them colleagues, but not peers, because these are my heroes in the philanthropic community. And I'm humbled to be uh, on the same dais as you. And I just hope my board chair and other board members um, aren't realizing their mistake in hiring an old, fat, white guy. <laughs> um, who's also passionate. So uh, I wonder if we have a question to get us started. Um, a couple of you mentioned, um, just at a very surface level, evaluation and measuring success. And I would just love to hear a little bit more about how your respective organizations have defined success and how you're, how you're measuring that with these different populations that you're trying to reach. Well, since I didn't 
get through my evaluation slide, I'll kick it off. Um, the Connecticut Health Foundation considers itself a learning organization, so we have consistently budgeted resources for evaluation to make smarter, more effective decisions and to always grow moving forward. Um, that said, I think we're in the midst of a shift. So um, previously, evaluation tended to be program evaluation. Um, it, it looked at very specific interventions that um, often occurred in a Petri dish, not really, but uh, you know, in a, a intervention setting. And, and now we're trying to look at um, the, some of the parts and, and to look at whether the whole is indeed uh, greater than the sum of the parts in terms of what we are uh, doing. So we're looking at more meta or initiative level evaluation. It's messier. It involves more uh, real-time uh, feedback and data loops so that we can make mid-course adjustments. So instead of waiting till the end of a program to get the report back, uh, we are trying to um, get information on an ongoing basis and not worrying about whether that interferes with our intervention because we're not uh, uh, doing bench research. We're, um, we're, we're trying to change the world. So, um, but I, I will mention that uh, what I was about to show you um, is a, a dashboard that we've been developing for some time. Um, it uh, has some commonalities with results-based accountability for those of you who are familiar with that model, though it is not results-based accountability, uh, but it has some uh, commonalities in principle. So um, we believe that um, no one organization, no one foundation can um, single-handedly achieve health equity in Connecticut. So uh, what we task ourselves with doing is um, on um, the right-hand side, now I'm confusing myself, but on the one side, we're um, looking at the state of the state. So we're, and behind the dashboard, the up, down, or sideways arrow, and the, the red, green, yellow, um, there are a bunch of spreadsheets and charts of data that feed into uh, sort of a single indicator, but we're using public health data sets to look at the state of um, health equity or the state of children's oral health to monitor um, where that's going uh, for our entire state. And then on the other side, we're looking at what we are doing, what our contribution to it is, um, and, and that, because that's all that we can really control. So we're looking at um, effort and quality of what it is that we're doing and some of the results that our grantees and partners are uh, reporting back to us. So that's um, the short of how we're approaching it. Unique or Nicole? Yeah, so we uh, collect uh, data from our grantee partners um, on you know, their individual work. So uh, their progress toward um, particular um, advocacy outcomes. And then, for example, our Language Act Access Coalition, when they were able to get hospitals in the area to all kind of form a language access committee and to implement um, the uh, Language Access Act uh, fully in their organizations, we, we look at that more qualitatively. I think the change that is coming for us is to think about how we evaluate collectively using more of a collective impact model for those of you who've heard about it. How does the entire field, um, in term, first in terms of capacity, have all the capacity that it needs to really move the needle, but then how do we evaluate together uh, what those outcomes are? And then f finally, as a funding community, we're also, we were just in a conversation this past week, you know, just saying, okay, what's everyone collecting, <laughs> right? So let's just bring together what we're all collecting and see if we can come up with either some common indicators that at least we all collect, um, even though we're working in different areas, some are health funders, um, others are education funders, but are there a common set of indicators that we can track together? So I think the innovation for us or the moving forward for us is about how do we collectively evaluate? I don't have much to add, so I will defer to another question. Okay, I think we have a virtual question. So we have a question from our online audience. Uh, what are the best tangible ways to ensure people experiencing disparities are involved in the solutions to eliminate them? Well, I am a firm believer that if you believe in equity and if you believe that communities hold the solutions and if you believe that people of color are tr truly as equally qualified and as competent, you would have them on your board, you would have them in senior leadership positions, and you would have them directing the work. 
Uh, let's see. So we, there are a number of things that we, we try to do. Uh, we, matter of fact, our 2009 shift that I mentioned in our, our strategic shift was really brought about as a result of uh, community conversations that we were having with hundreds of people across the region. So, and, and we're in the middle of another um, planning process and doing a similar thing, you know, needing to meet with people who are just regular folks to understand what it is that they're thinking about, what's really affecting their lives. I mean, we heard in 2009 um, for you know, the very first time in a really concrete way how um, people were dealing with racism or people were de dealing with a lack of cultural competency when they would enter a healthcare setting. And so as a result of that, we actually started to uh, we, we started out with healthcare work, but we have now gone beyond that, like I explained in my talk, to include all the other aspects of one's life that it takes to be healthy. And that was a, a result, direct result of, of having those conversations um, with communities. Uh, you know, Nicole, you just mentioned about um, the board issue, and that's a really important one. Our board is very diverse, um, we're at 62% people of color. But no one on our board um, has current low socioeconomic position. And so we're really, as a board and um, staff, trying to figure out how we might do something different about that so that we can make sure that mm -hmm. the people that we are um, trying to serve, the people that we're talking about, also have much more of a say in the work that we do. I think for us, um, the leadership development work that we've done in many different forums has been particularly effective. I mentioned briefly our formal leadership development program, but uh, we try to use other strategies to um, develop uh, people who can be um, champions, ambassadors, and change agents for health equity from all walks of life and all reaches in the community. And when we have this network and we keep cultivating the network. It's not just do it and send them off, but it's, it's an um, ongoing uh, focus on network development that we do. Um, then we have a, a group to draw from uh, when, because there are people uh, creating, setting decision-making tables who um, want these perspectives. And it's not just that we want um, input from people affected, but we want them uh, at the table. So we frequently say, if you're uh, not at the table, you're on the menu. So, uh, I, and I believe that to be true. So it's also um, having in our back pocket uh, people that we as a foundation can help to nominate to, to get at these tables of influence. Uh, this question is for Dr. Redwood. Um, this is in regard to the maps that you were showing, one of those maps particularly regarding the Washington DC stratification. Um, it, it was broken down into creative class, working class, and service class. I'm unfamiliar with those terms, and I was just wondering if you'd be able to elaborate on what those designations means, mean for those people who yeah. belong to those respective classes. Yeah, so this map is actually drawn from Atlantic Cities. I don't know if you know that website and that publication. So that terminology is straight from um, Atlantic Cities. And so the creative class, and I actually have a little trouble with that uh, definition, um, but uh, it means uh, for them, they've defined it as uh, the more highly, highly educated uh, workers in the DC region. And then the service class would be your, your, your service workers, your domestic care workers, restaurant workers. Um, that's how they, they've defined it. Um, you know, I don't, re I don't recall like how they actually define it. Like if there's an income range, I'm not sure. Um, I, I actually zeroed in on the creative and the service class because the map is so stark. <laughs> um, I have another question from Twitter. What do you mean by community health workers and what role can they play? Uh, so, um, I, and I don't, there are, different uh, definitions of community health workers out there. I think there's a national association that probably has the most widely used definition. Um, but, and there have been questions, are, are the navigators and assisters who are going to be out there enrolling people community health workers? I don't think they meet the, the technical definition, but if they're part of the community and they're getting paid to help 
people improve their health, might we consider them at least potential uh, formal community health workers? So that's my way of deflecting to say um, I, I don't come uh, with a definition to spout out, but I um, mean uh, people from the community who can help in the, the, the navigation aspect uh, in the health education and the disease management aspects of um, healthcare. Um, Often people need uh, support making their way through the healthcare system. I don't have to convince anybody here that it's really broken, it's disconnected, it's confusing, it doesn't meet people's cultural and linguistic or health literacy needs. Your um, insurance companies are finding ways to deny you all the time. You know, what's your, what are your appeal rights? What's the process? How do you get to see a specialist more quickly? There are a lot of... Uh, things that a uh, community-based health worker uh, that is affiliated with an uh, organization can help people to uh, navigate. So some people know community health workers as promotores, as, um, let's see, there are lots of different community um, health advisors was a, a term uh, that was used in the context of some community-based uh, participatory research that I had been involved with. Um, and they, they tend to be, again, um, uh, hired as, by direct service organizations to provide some um, augmenting services, and the fundamental problem is that they haven't uh, been sustainable. I am aware that there's a lot of federal interest in, um, what we're gonna see is as we expand healthcare, a lot of formerly uninsured people are going to come into the system, and they're not going to have the experience in, experiences and skills to be able to navigate, and the system is going to be a moving target and changing um, in the midst of all of this at the same time. So um, my question to the community is to let phil the philanthropic field know how we can add value to um, advancing community health workers as a true part of the sustainable healthcare system where they're meeting consumer and uh, patient needs. So um, I, I think there's a lot that we can do there. Uh, hi, great presentations. I'm Jason Balling from Spark Policy Institute um, and also the president-elect of CPHA, Colorado Public Health Association. Two questions. One is I truly believe the lived experiences of the community are so important in driving what we do. The fact is there's a lot of distrust, especially in communities with foundations, government institutions, um, advocacy organizations. And also, there's some tokenism that goes on of saying, come to the table, give us your advice, but there's no actual reimbursement for people's time. Mm -hmm. Somebody said the fact that we need to dive much deeper into funding organizations, but funding community members. What are your thoughts about ways that we can actually address social determinants of health by addressing income, by further funding community organizers or people in the community to bring that perspective back? And then my second question is looking at place-based settings and social determinants of health, and how can we start to bring the work that we're doing and the awareness we're generating to schools, to work sites, to organizations, to government settings, and figuring out what are the interventions that can happen within a setting, because I think we all realize that it needs to be community-based, but there's other opportunities there. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll try to share some examples of how we have tried to address your sort of first question. So um, we believe strongly in funding policy advocacy and leadership development. And, um, and that sounds really great, but it's tricky when you sort of think about what you actually fund. So we've done some different things. We've made some mistakes along the way, um, but some really exciting things have also happened as a result. Um, one of the things that we have tried to do is to very concretely fund different voices to be at the table around advocacy. And so um, for five years, we actually funded a cohort of policy advocates. And it actually started out of being sort of more of the traditional health advocacy groups. And then we noticed, hey, there's really not anyone representing the communities um, there. And, and it was interesting because we got a lot of pushback. Folks were, um, you know, the response was, well, there aren't any policy, health policy advocacy groups in communities of color. Well, 
There actually were, they just looked different and they might be part of a larger social service organization or might be part of a different consortium and they very much were doing health policy advocacy and actually they were much more in touch with the community because they were running the clinic on one side and doing the, the advocacy on the other side or they were, um, you know, oftentimes make their strategic plan was created by thousands of constituents as opposed to um, just a board. So they brought a lot to the table. So we gave peer operating grants and basically the requirement was you have to come and be part of a cohort and develop shared goals and you know in the beginning it was very hard for people to have shared goals and it was hard to get the sort of traditional health policy people to you know collaborate and work with the communities of color and there was you know um, challenges in the beginning but you know the the first two legislative sessions they they had some great progress it was the first time our state capital had people of color and low-income people there advocating all the time our legislators were like who are you know what's going on um, and I'm proud to say that this last legislative um, session they became known as the five for five coalition because they got all five of their legislative um, efforts passed. They um, got prenatal care for undocumented immigrants. Um, they passed a, a piece of legislation all around um, collecting accurate data across our state, representing all um, ethnic communities of color. And, you know, it was, it was tough, but they really saw results. And I think part of it is being in it for the long haul. And, um, you know, there's certainly things we would do differently, but it was, it was very successful. The other thing I would add, um, is most recently we were part of funding a, a very big initiative to try to pass fluoridation. We're the only major city in America that's not fluoridated. We didn't win, we're still not fluoridated. Um, but we did something a little bit unique and we were pretty criticized, we got a lot of criticism for it, but we actually funded seven nonprofits based in communities of color and low-income communities to do voter turnout and to get people to vote. And um, it was really interesting. Folks were really surprised by that, and we had a lot of questions about why we did that, and we were sort of like, we want to win. That's why we did it. Um, and it was very interesting that folks were very comfortable paying organizers in a traditional campaign setting to go out and get our affluent four for four voters, but when it came to paying community organizations of color to go and get their communities to vote, there was a lot of backlash. And so I think it's being willing to take those risks. And I think being in philanthropy, you have to be willing to take more risks. So I'll add that we, we don't do a lot of direct work in communities. We really trust our nonprofit partners to do that kind of work. But um, we do fund uh, an array of nonprofit partners. So especially those that are led by people of color, the small ones, the ones that can't get a lot of funding in other places, we, we definitely take the risk and fund in those places as well. So we think that because of the way we fund and because we have such a, we place such a premium on capacity building, we, we always dedicate resources to capacity building, that um, if we can do that with our nonprofit partners, we believe that they're very connected to communities and that's kind of how we see our role in working with communities. Next question. Thank you. Ira Gorman, Regis University. Um, there's a trend that I heard um, from all three of you about income disparity. I grew up in New York and yes, Connecticut is where we went to camp in the summer. <laughs> but um, you have these um, tremendous income disparate um, communities. And we heard this week that we're, as a nation, at the highest level of income disparity in 100 years. So I, I guess, you know, um, Dr. Red mentioned that we don't have scarce resources, but it's really an allocation of resources problem. And, and income, I think, is the same thing. We have plenty of income in the country. It's how it's um, allocated and separated. So how can foundations help not just um, delivering funds and opportunities to bring up the bottom, but how can we work as a collective to and, you know, diminish this separation that I believe is, you know, very dangerous. So um, I, I mentioned in my talk the, um, the wealth building initiative, and I think that is one, um, one way that we're really hoping to see uh, movement uh, in terms of income inequality. So we, we believe that if there are living wage opportunities 
in traditionally low-income communities of color, then we will start to see some of that change in the region. So we're trying to seed that innovation. And then um, because the, the, the model works by linking to large existing anchor institutions, so your hospitals, your universities, your local governments, and to really change the way they procure services and products so that they are local, um, in some senses more local, um, more sustainable then, and um, those, those services can then be provided by people in the community who, who traditionally wouldn't, wouldn't have an opportunity to earn a living wage. And so that's one test for us um, in this area of income inequality to try to figure out, can, can this worker own a cooperative really help us shift that dy dynamic? I mean, I think we as a foundation, when you look at our direct grant making for programs, you'll see a lot of investments in economic opportunity, education, um, innovation. So we believe in really making those investments and a lot of investments in early childhood are, are very important. Um, but, but I think there's a bigger picture as well. Um, I mentioned the, the fluoride campaign and while we didn't win, I think the best thing about it is that I suspect that no political campaign will ever be ran the same way in Portland as a result of that. Um, that special election actually had a larger share of African American voters than the, the last presidential election did. Mm -hmm. um, and what it showed is that for a moderate investment, there you can really change the level of civic engagement and voice. And um, I believe in, we'll see different outcomes as a result. And I believe every political consultant in town is really paying attention to that because um, I like that example, but it was true in, in many other communities as well. So I think for us, we do have a C4 um, status with our endowment. So we're allowed to do some creative things. And um, I think that's important. But the leadership development piece is also very, very important. Um, and I will just share about one of our colleagues, Meyer Memorial Trust in, in Oregon. Actually, um, it started out as a, they did a million dollar idea. And the community came back and said, it was sort of like, give us your best idea and we'll put a million dollars to it. And the idea that they chose was this idea that um, the most important thing we can do for the future of Oregon is invest in um, leaders from underserved communities and make them the strongest leaders, po leaders possible. And our leadership as a state will be better when they're at the table. Um, it's now, they've now invested several more million dollars and other foundations are joining. But as a result of that, um, the coalition I mentioned earlier has been a lead partner. Um, they've now had several cohorts from those six communities and there are, there's an abundance of leaders. And I think um, those two pieces are, are so incredibly important because um, while it's important to make direct grants to great programs that exist, I think we also have to change the conversation and who's participating in the conversation if we will ever address the, the income inequalities and bring different people with different sets of values to the table. Let me uh, take the host prerogative and ask my question. <clears throat> so we've started on a journey, uh, as, as you are all, and we've, I've had a chance now to listen to you and now three conversations. I found some interesting similarities. The diversity of the communities that we serve as philanthropists is really variable. Um, and yet each one of you have talked about how difficult it's been raising awareness around health equity issues within your communities. And even leadership that, that I work with talks about that phrase, health equity is jargon and no one knows what it means and we need to, to use different words. And, and so I often, you know, I came from evidence-based medicine. I was a voice in the wilderness for 20 years. I feel being a voice in the wilderness again around health equity. How do you take that on as a foundation leader, make those words come alive and make that voice amplified so that we're hearing the equity words come back from our partners? So we uh, have been doing a lot of work on this, um, on communications, so really trying to make it plain. And, uh, you know, we want everyone to be able to live a healthy and dignified life. People seem to get that. Um, they seem to, you know, even if there isn't a definition after each of those words, they get what dignity means. And so we're, we're, we're trying to see if that would be helpful. Um, we also use our uh, annual meetings every year to really lift up equity and to really um, 
help people to understand what it means. And our annual reports, uh, we also use that every year for the past several years to do that work. So we're, we're learning too. We're trying to figure out what's, what's going to click for people. And so far, when I talk to people and say, we just want everyone to live a healthy and dignified life, it seems like people are getting that. You know, I've been equally frustrated because I feel like the terminology um, is woefully inadequate. And uh, I think I was complaining about this to Chris on the phone once. And he said, well, Elizabeth, it's, it's, that's the best that we have for now. Like, he was uh, much more um, <laughs> patient and, and accepting of it. Um, so uh, and I, I think he's right that um, it's sort of the best that we have right now. But um, the Connecticut Health Foundation did focus groups several years back with um, middle class, uh, African Americans, Latinos, and uh, white Connecticut residents, all who uh, were employed and had health insurance. And, and we tested some terms with them. And they thought health equity had to do with health savings accounts. And um, <laughs> so the, the concept was pretty lost in them. And as we were going through the unveiling of our new strategic plan, um, I was just pulling out my hair left and right, like fretting about how uh, the definitions floating out there really weren't fully serving uh, where I want us to go. So that's why we decided to pull back and to just say for the Connecticut Health Foundation, the health equity we're trying to create is more access to better care mm -hmm. for people of color and just kind of really trying to drill down to the pieces that people could grasp, but it, it's much bigger than that. And um, I, I, I wanted, um, I, I didn't really try to get board support for this, but my big idea was to put out a $10,000 prize to come up with a really great uh, definition that was going to have uh, resonance. But it's a, it's a huge concept that's kind of bundled together. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually try not to use health equity. I try to really describe it much more about our region having a shared destiny and really talking about um, how we all impact each other's well-being. It's really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other piece I would say is I think that there's really a need for positive tension around this. And there has to also be a willingness for philanthropy to fund advocacy and to fund our partners to help us be better because we would do report after report and focus group after focus group. Um, and we need our peers and the larger community to sort of ask us to make a decision. Are you going to invest in this or not? Are you going to make this change? Are you going to add people to your board or not? At some point, um, actions have to be the message. And I think that um, that can be very scary, but it can also really help you do the things that you already want to do it can empower you to do that from, from a philanthropic institution. Um, when we did the philanthropic report I talked about earlier, we had one foundation who said, I'll do this as long as you don't recommend that we have to give more money to people of color. Wow. Chris, you said you had one really good last question. Well, it's, it's a really simple, straightforward question from Twitter. Um, what are the best steps to train all CEOs, docs, neighbors in cultural competency, power, and privilege? <laughs> Simple one to end on. I'll start. Um, so at the Consumer Health Foundation, we've done a lot of um, work over the years in terms of educating ourselves internally. And I think that's the, the key is to actually um, start to have conversations about your own experiences with race, with immigration, kind of really connecting on a personal level around these issues, um, uh, and then moving to how they show up structurally um, in, our, in our various regions and um, across the country. And so uh, that, that internal education has been really important for us, both at the board level and at the staff level, together as board and staff and separately. And then, like I mentioned, um, the annual reports, the, the annual meetings, really using those as opportunities to really understand and continue to educate ourselves about these issues. For me, I think, um, well, I personally would like everyone to go into deep reflection mode and to understand and to care 
that's not entirely necessary. Um, and I, I, it took me a long time to grapple with that and to let that go. But I think um, leaders just want um, a framework and, and practical solutions that they can implement in, in how they practice and how they do business that uh, can make a difference to people. And I've found that what tends to be effective is when um, the person uh, doing the training is from the community being trained. So um, in the past, I've been asked to train mental health clinicians, but I'm not a mental health clinician, so I've refused. Uh, we funded our state medical society. Uh, Connecticut has, uh, requires one contact hour of um, cultural competence education for physicians, for licensure. And um, you know, the, the best uh, trainer is um, a, a white female surgeon who is uh, non-threatening but somehow breaks through these barriers to be able to uh, talk to her peers in a way that they respect, in a way that they listen to, and in a way that um, shows that she understands the realities that they are practicing within. And, and then they also want to see outcomes and that um, change is possible. But I, I believe that you can do harm by implementing poorly executed trainings. It actually makes people disengage and write it off. Um, and, and so I think it's more important than people often realize to uh, be very strategic and to pick the right trainer for the audience that you're trying to work with. I, I would agree with all of that and just add that in any training, it's so important to teach cultural humility and to teach people that it's okay to be wrong. Um, I think in majority culture, oftentimes there's this idea if you make a cultural mistake, you're gonna be labeled racist and you can never go back. And all of us make cultural mistakes mm -hmm. all of the time. Mm -hmm. I worked in a Native American organization for 11 years. We served 380 tribes. I'm fairly sure I did something culturally incompetent to one of those tribes on a regular basis. And you have to teach people that it's okay to make a mistake, to apologize, to ask questions, and that um, you know, we're all on this earth together and have to figure out how to be together. We could go on for a long time. I'm afraid it's time to wrap up. Um, I, it's been a great conversation, and just join me real quickly in thanking our guests one more time. <laughs> At the Trust, we, we really believe that by learning more, by engaging and talking to communities, the Colorado Trust really has the, uh, the ability to advance fair and equal opportunities for all Coloradans to lead productive, healthy lives, regardless of race, ethnicity, income, or where we live. I, I hope you heard a little of the humility in my peers going forward. They talked about making mistakes. And, and we have to realize that we're going to do that, working together in this work. We have to embrace those mistakes and learn from them and not kind of say we never are wrong, which I always worry about. Because this is a journey and it's a learning journey and we're gonna get better together. I really hope you can join us for the next learning session we have uh, planned. It's uh, Dr. Anthony Eaton from the Colorado uh, I'm sorry, the California Endowment and Dr. Winston Wong from Kaiser Permanente in the, uh, in the, uh, the Northern California District. We'll continue the discussion about solutions to tackle social determinants of health. I encourage you, I would ask you please, as, as the only thing you had to do uh, for your lunch other than open your minds and learn would be to fill out the survey. That would be great. It makes it uh, able for us to do a better job. And then I really can't close without thanking those folks who make it uh, possible for us to have events like this today. Starting with those who make all of our events work, Patricia Martinez, Elisa Bourne, and Jill Johnson. As well as our Health Equity Learning Series team, Courtney Ricci, Maggie Frazier, and Chris Armijo. And of course, the Board of Trustees of the Colorado Trust. Thanks each of you for joining us today. Drive carefully out in the wet world. And I look forward to seeing you the next time. Thank you. <laughs>